next up is a crashing MacBook. This looks like a 2010 model MacBook Pro. These are common for the C9560 issue. Let's see if we can fix the fact that it crashes constantly and won't even make its way into an operating system. Once the board is out of the case, if you turn it around, you'll see that there's a capacitor right over here. It's going to be right here on the board, and this is the one that we're going to be replacing with a new one. I'll show you it under the microscope. This is the capacitor over here, C9560. And as you can see, C9560 goes to R5413, which is a current sense resistor, and the output of this is going to wind up going to the graphics chip and also the graphics chip memory. This is the frame buffer regulator circuit. So this is for the frame buffer for the GPU. This is the capacitor on output that's going to store the pulses that are created by the buck converter. This buck converter is going to take 12 volts from PP bus G3 hot over here. This line is supposed to be going over here. Ignore the Apple engineer that was stoned. See how this line goes back into itself and touches itself? There was an Apple engineer that was touching himself that night, and he managed to write that into the schematic. This line is supposed to go down here. It's not supposed to touch itself like Pee Wee Herman in the 1990s in a movie theater. So PP bus G3 hot here is going to go through this transistor. PP bus G3 hot is a 12.6 volt line. However, we need about 1.5 to 1.8 volts for our frame buffer output. The way this is going to work is simple. This transistor is going to switch on and off, on and off, on and off, as U9500 tells it to. U9500 is going to control this transistor. Think of the transistor like a switch. So you're going to get 12 volts, then zero then 12, then 0, then 12, and then 0. And a little bit of 12 and a lot of 0. A little bit of 12 and a lot of 0 is going to average itself out to 1.8 volts. Now, those pulses are going to be smoothed out by this inductor over here, L9560. This inductor over here is going to smooth it out because the inductor is not good at responding to quick changes, and then that's going to get stored by the capacitor. However, if this capacitor dies over time because it's a teeny tiny polytantalum rather than a nice, beautiful, large sexy capacitor like the one that we sell on store.rossmangroup.com. Check out store.rossmangroup.com where you can find capacitors, chips, hot air rework stations, soldering stations, and more. Check it out by typing either the model number of your motherboard or simply the component that you need. You can type in 820-2850, scroll down, and find the kernel panicking capacitor. This capacitor is available for the low, low price of $769. Same day shipping from New York City, this capacitor is a very easy capacitor to replace. Even though that we're fitting a bigger capacitor into the space, this capacitor actually has separate legs under it so you don't have to scrape the board like we used to in prior videos. So I'm going to show you how it is we take this capacitor off the board. I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how to do so, and I'm going to shill for store.rossmangroup.com, because that's what we do here. And let's get to shilling. So, I'm going to take my hot air. And I'm actually going to put it over the capacitor itself. I want to minimize the amount of hot air that goes to my CPU. I do not want to heat my CPU. The CPU is right next to this. So I'm actually going to leave the heat sink on while I'm doing this for the CPU. I don't typically do this. I typically preheat the board. But it's very important here to me that I do not heat up my CPU. Many people that do this and then wind up having a dead computer afterwards use their hot air for too long. They do too much harm to their CPU. Anytime you got a CPU right next to what you're working on, you want to be really, really careful. All right, so I added some leaded solder. Now I'm going to wick away this combination of leaded and lead-free solder. Now what you used to have to do is you used to have to scrape away over here so that the larger capacitor would fit. So what I've done here is we found a capacitor that has the proper specifications that doesn't require scraping. And I'll show you how this is so once we're done putting this here. This is the capacitor. The positive end of the capacitor is going to be the end of the capacitor that has the bar. Now you may notice this capacitor is bigger, so how is it going to fit? Well, this is the beauty of store.rossmangroup.com, folks. As you can see, this capacitor doesn't have two pads under it. It has three pads under it. So, this is going to be the positive pad, this is going to be the ground pad, and that's also the ground pad. So you do not need to solder this one. You can simply solder this pad and this pad and you're good. So the pad that has the bar on it is going to go in the middle. So we're just going to solder it like this, and that's going to be just fine. So I'm going to pick up my hot air station, and I'm going to do my best to heat the capacitor without heating the CPU. Notice, folks, that I'm really trying hard to direct my nozzle in the proper direction so that I don't heat up the CPU or the GPU. 
If you heat up the CPU with a GPU, you're going to wind up with a dead motherboard. So don't do that. And I'm going to grab my tweezers so that one side is on top of the capacitor to push down, and the other side is on the side of the capacitor to ensure that it doesn't run away. So I've pushed the capacitor down while simultaneously holding it in place so that I have the optimal position for my now beautifully soldered and mounted capacitor. I'm going to really briefly touch that little solder ball so that it doesn't go anywhere it's not supposed to. And now, as you can see, that capacitor is perfectly soldered onto the board. Doesn't it look great, folks? Sure does. Now we're going to replace the thermal paste because it would be mean to leave that crappy stock thermal paste on the machine when this customer is spending some good money. Now, do keep in mind, this does not fix 17-inch models from the same year and does not fix 2011 machines. You see a lot of videos on YouTube where people are fixing their 2011 machines or trying to by applying this solution. This solution only works on 820-2850s. Junk. Garbage. Really dig in there and make it nice and clean. Razor blades are the only thing that uses a higher bulk conductivity paste sees an improvement. Razor blades are some really bad laptops. Those boards are garbage. I would almost use a MacBook before I used a razor. They have a lot of Apple-ish tendencies. Not selling batteries, motherboards that blow up and get holes in them, crappy support for the motherboards that blow up and get holes in them, repeating your mistakes year after year. Lenovo makes some good machines, but their gaming computers are really, really bad. What I wish Lenovo would do, so that I could recommend them to people who actually want to play games, is get rid of that IdeaPad Y580 kind of stuff that they have and make something that's like the ThinkPad, ThinkPad P-Series, except put something but a Quadro in it. And literally, just take the ThinkPad P50 or P51, replace the Quadro with a proper graphics chip that's for gaming, and there you go. And you've made something that people are going to love. The problem with Lenovo's gaming lineup is that the idea pads are made like complete and utter garbage, like most other brands of laptops, which sucks. MSI is decent, but I'm not impressed by MSI. MSI is the same fault that most other crappy PC laptops have. For example, in a high-end laptop, the power jack should never be soldered to the board. That's inexcusable in 2018. There's no reason for that. You should have a power jack that then has a cable that goes to the motherboard. So this way you can wobble and put pressure on the power jack all you want, but it's never going to come desoldered from the board. And MSI, like most other, you know, lame-ass PC brands and models of laptop, they don't do that. It's lame. It's just, it's these really small things that let me know that you cared about making something that's going to last. And I've yet to meet a gaming laptop that was, that was made decently. Where I, where I could say there's no criticism. If somebody took a ThinkPad P51 and replaced the Quadro with a proper gaming GPU, that would be really cool. But then it wouldn't, get, it wouldn't win in marketing because the ThinkPad doesn't look like a gaming laptop. It looks like a boring business laptop. To have a gaming laptop, it needs to look all lit with colors and the keyboards and funny looking you know, devil horns and shit on the edges or whatever the hell. Every time I see a gaming laptop, they put all this effort into making it look all lead and hardcore and raw. So they needed to make a laptop that, you know, that, that did all that, which is why I get, I get why Lenovo did what they did with their gaming series. But I really think that it would be good for them and their reputation if they took the ThinkPad, they changed the color of it to look all super elite or whatever, uh, you know, 1337 and all that shit, put some of that lame horse crap RGB garbage into the keyboard so that people go, look, it's colors, it's colors, and then put a real GPU in it. You'd have a machine that lasts for a really fucking long time, and you'd have a computer with a badass GPU, and, and Lenovo knows how to make a cooling system. That I know. If, if they really wanted to make some kind of Republic of Gamers large machine, they could make something with a really nice cooling system. What do you think about HP laptops? They make some of the worst laptops of all time. Besides some of their Elite Book series, they are, pro they are up there with, as one of the worst brands ever. From the casings falling apart, where the hinges meet the bottom case, or the hinges meet the, the screen assembly, the, all that plasticky stuff falling apart, to the failing cooling systems, to the heat sinks that are barely even touching the chip. H HP is garbage. They have a couple of good models, a couple of good Elite Books. And that's the thing, it's hit or miss. They make some really good, some good stuff, a lot of complete crap. All right, so it turns on without crashing. I'm gonna run some Furmark on this. Damn, this person's got a lot of torrents. Damn, your piracy game's on point, customer. I'm trying to find my download and it's buried in torrents. So many torrents. All right, look at this beauty. Look at that, we're getting 4.4 frames a second with 2x anti-aliasing. Look at that. Look at how fast this thing is. Look at it, it's being a Mac. 
All right, so we're going to have this run. So before, this couldn't even boot into the operating system without GPU kernel panics. And now it's able to run this Unigen thing. It's able to run it at the speed that you would expect an eight-year-old Apple laptop to run it at, which appears to be four to five frames a second. However, it is running. So that's that. That's how you fix the GPU kernel panicking issue. And as always, I hope you learned something. <clears throat> Paul Daniels. Monk. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, come on. You. F Paul. Paul Daniels, I updated your software. I said that I never update people's software, Paul. I made an exception for you. What are you doing to me? Damn it. Oh, well.